welcome this evening, this, this Friday evening after a very long and hard week. I am really excited about tonight's town hall called Let the People Decide. And this town hall was inspired by a film that we're gonna be seeing a clip from. The film is available to everyone who has registered for this town hall, everyone who's affiliated with this town hall uh, by the grace of, the, uh, of the, the film producer who we have with us tonight. And um, the film is, is riveting, really. And it's about how people have been denied the right to vote. And so what we decided to do at the sanctuary is to show you a clip of this video and then do a town hall on um, voting rights in 2020 in New York, in the capital region, um, to share resources, to talk about the issues that are at stake in this election. Um, so I'm really, really glad that you all joined us this evening and we've got uh, a tremendous lineup of speakers tonight who are all going to be sharing bits and pieces of this puzzle and then we'll come back together at the end to talk. Um, this event uh, is co-sponsored by a long list of amazing groups. Uh, the NAACP of Troy, Nature Labs Health Autonomy Clinic out of the Sanctuary, the Rensselaer County League of Women Voters, Capital District Latinos, Russell Sage College, the, Col the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at Rensselaer, uh, the NAACP Albany, the NAACP Schenectady, the New York Civil Liberties Union, the Justice Center, the People's Perception Project, uh, Albany District Links, uh, uh, the, campaign, the Campaign for New York Health, and BirthNet. And there may have been others who joined after. Um, we've been working really hard to, to bring everyone into this umbrella. Um, this event is also an iEar Presents event. It was made possible by funding from the New York State Council on the Arts as part of the Arts Department and the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Rensselaer. Um, the format of this evening is a town hall. Uh, it's going to be in three distinct parts. The first part will be um, a little snippet of the film Let the People Decide. And then we're going to have a Q&A with the brilliant filmmaker, Gavin Guerra. Um, he's going to be addressing then and now. Um, and, and he graciously um, gave a, a workshop to uh, the sanctuary earlier on how the film was produced. So really, we're going to be focusing on what the film tells us about then and now tonight at tonight's town hall, and not so much about filmmaking, although I'm sure Gavin can say a lot about the filmmaking process and has. Um, the second part of this town hall is on voting in 2020. What are the rules this time around? They've changed in New York, um, you know, and, um, and so uh, what are they? Where, where can you vote? What are some of the complicated factors? And we've got some experts on the line that are going to address that. Then um, we're going to talk about uh, we're either going to, I think we're going to take a break at that point, a five minute break, get some water, stretch yourself, we'll hear some music, just a five minute break, and then we'll come back together and talk about the issues that are at stake. Racial justice, health care, um, you know, a whole, there's a whole range of issues that are really at stake during this election. And then for part three, we'll turn to the practical. Um, what does mutual aid look like? Uh, as we approach this election. What kind of community partnerships exist that you can take advantage of? What kind of community partnerships can we forge? And what's happening on the ground that, that we can all plug into and help amplify one another's efforts so that we can get folks to the polls? Because that is really what we need to do. Um, we have a number of speakers in each section. You'll be able to ask a few questions after each segment or use the chat box at the bottom uh, to type in your question. Uh, and we'll either address them uh, in the chat box if they're easy questions, we'll ask them live of the panelists, or uh, at the very end, we'll have some time for more q and I want to start by recognizing two things. 
One, uh, that the work that we need to do as a community is not just about voting. It doesn't end with voting. That's really where our real work begins. Um, people died for our right to vote. I think what we'll demonstrate during tonight's town hall is that our very lives depend on who we vote for, both you know, at the local level and at the federal level. But then beyond that, just voting is not gonna save us. We have to work together to save us. And I'm so excited about talking about building local power with Anastasia Robins Robertson. That's gonna be a really important piece, um, but it does not end with the vote. It, it's almost like it begins with the vote and then the real work kicks in. The other thing I wanna acknowledge is how difficult this week has been. And I acknowledged this to our panelists a little while ago. Um, you know, in some ways people say that black women are gonna save us in November and our society has not done right by them. Uh, and so I'm moderating this panel. Uh, I know that some of my um, black sisters, my loved ones are not on this call tonight because this has been one heck of a week. So I just wanna acknowledge that and I wanna thank those of you who could be on. Um, it's a great, it, it's really a, a great, uh, it's just a great honor to have you on. So with that, I am going to um, turn it over to our tech people to show 10 minutes of the film, Let the People Decide. We are in a rigged system. And I'm afraid the election's gonna be rigged, I have to be honest. Denying the truth about voter suppression. How easy should it be to become a registered voter? We will make America great again. We will make America great again. We shall have order in the United States. I am the law and order candidate. It was guerrilla warfare. That which is happening now is not doing racial relations any good. And we are in enemy territory. But let's take the matter of both sides. This is a part of a plan that we have warned you about that is for the purpose of immobilizing this nation. And we're going to take the country back. When you mess with the right to vote, you mess with the heart of our democracy. revolutionary act in Mississippi, you know, uh, it's an act of treason against the state to get black folks to vote. So voting was absolutely dangerous business. So when Herbert Lee went to register to vote, he was murdered by his next door neighbor, E.H. Hearst, at the cotton gin the next morning. Hearst was a member of the Mississippi State Legislature. Hearst followed him down to the cotton gin um, and picked the argument shot him. I was back in my poem. His body had been left in the streets for several hours. They didn't know what to do. And they want me to go down and take a look at it. And there was Herbert Lee with this uh, bullet wound in the side of his head. Right. Was that the first body you'd ever seen? Yeah, right. Kevin 
Kevin Phillips was a very young and bright and ambitious advisor to Attorney General John Mitchell, and he wrote a book called The Emerging Republican Majority. I got in to see uh, campaign manager John Mitchell and basically said, I've got a book which I think outlines what's going to happen in American presidential politics and sort of where to put your chips and what's happening. And the basic argument he makes is, yes, race can be used as a wedge issue to break the New Deal coalition of working class whites and African Americans and Northeastern elites. I said that the key thing they had to do in the last weeks of that campaign was North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, and Southern Illinois, and if they carried that group, they were in. What Kevin Phillips was saying to the Nixon administration was that as black voters were flocking in increasing numbers to the Democratic Party, that white voters would flock in increasing numbers to the Republican Party. And it should be the policy of the Nixon administration to encourage those conservative white voters to join the Republican Party. That's the route to an enduring Republican majority. The question was, where would these Southerners who have been Democrats and run the Democratic Party go now when all these black people are trying to get in and getting into the party? It was no longer the, their party. Um, they didn't want integration. They wanted things like they were. Parties switched places very, very abruptly by the standards of how history moves. If you go back to 1875 and the idea that one whole section of the country is uh, going to be organized around a political subdivision based on white superiority. And they find their home in the National Democratic Party. And they operate now for three quarters of a century. The country operates with this. And then the civil rights movement upends that arrangement. And then you turn around and that same group finds a home in the Republican Party. I mean, it didn't take a blink of an eye to change party hats, but they're there, right? It's the same crowd. They just, they just changed hats. They didn't, they didn't have any problem doing it either. This is cold and calculating. They looked around, they thought about how best they could manipulate voters, how best they could win elections, and they recognized as a matter of strategy that they could use race to win. the most important pieces of civil rights legislation ever passed. But by five to four, the U.S. Supreme Court today took the teeth out of a law enacted nearly 50 years ago. What the court did today is say it's outdated. We had worked so hard, we had struggled so long, people had lost their lives for this, and bam, it's taken away just like that. I said to myself, do we have to fight these battles all over again? And we turn to a strict new voter ID law in North Carolina, which is putting a spotlight on the broader national fight over when and where people can cast ballots. We are not trying to suppress anybody. We are not trying to oppress anybody. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with who you say you are. Number one, we know it's racial. One of them was on camera and said, if it hurts a bunch of lazy blacks, it wants the government to give them everything, so be it. The left loves to throw a race card every chance they get so they can agitate their base and get them mad about it. It's BS. It's a BS argument. You know, you can't say this on TV, uh, but it's a BS argument. Of course it's race. How can you say it's anything else? What can't you do if you don't have an ID? You can't cash a check. You can't get Medicare. Can't get Medicaid. Can't get welfare. Can't travel. Can't get a job. ID cards are needed to conduct life as a responsible citizen. And for anyone who doesn't take the responsibility to get their ID and get it straight, 
maybe they're not smart enough to vote. It was at that point that we said, listen, we have marched, we have lobbied, we have advocated, we've gone to the hearings. This is over the top. We said, no, we have to go to the next level. You think you've seen a fight? You ain't seen nothing yet. The Bible says clearly in Isaiah 10, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights. If you do not leave immediately, I'm going to place you under arrest. Yes, sir. Do you understand? I understand you. Will you leave? No, sir. I need you to turn out the tent. Yes, sir. The more you refuse to hear my voice, the louder I will sing. No, I have to be cuffed in the front. I'm not going to be cuffed in the back. I'm not. I can't. Yes, I can dictate. Do you see that I have an injury? And you need to stop bending my wrist. When the arrest began, it just snowballed, and before we knew it, in a few months, the rallies had grown to multiple thousands of people. And we reclaimed uh, morality uh, in political discourse. Let the people, let the people, let the people, let the people, let the people decide. Decide. Let the people, let the people, people, let the people, let the people decide. Let the people decide. The people united will never be defeated. Well, well, thank you um, to our IT folks for playing that clip and thank you to Gavin for making this film. Um, looking to make sure you're back on camera, Gavin. Um, Am I not back on camera? There is. Good, good. I can't see him, but I'm glad you can, Brenda. Thank you. <laughs> I just think I have to, we have too many people on here, which is great. Thank you all for joining. I know that some of you joined uh, this town hall during the playing of that clip. Um, we're going to start out with some questions to uh, the to the filmmaker. So, Gavin, I, I guess the first question that people might be asking is, uh, was that the whole film? No, the whole film is so great. And if you haven't seen it yet, there is a, a password protected, I guess, right, Branda, a password protected way for all of the participants on this town hall to see the entire film, which is well worth your time. It's a feature length documentary. And Gavin, thank you for making it and thank you for being here with us tonight. If folks have questions for Gavin, you can place them in the chat box. Um, but I'm gonna start out with one. Um, could you talk about why this film is important what are we 40 days out from the election some of these horrible uh, restrictions on voting rights have passed as a result of the 2010 elections i know that there's been a lot of pushback but why is it important for us to watch this film now 40 days out uh first thank you all for having me uh, it's a great honor to uh, be on this panel with everybody and, and to, to speak about the film. Um, that clip you saw obviously was edited. It was a few minutes from each act. Uh, it wasn't even necessarily sequentially right. So like she said, there's, there's a whole film to see. I hope you all get a chance to see it. Uh, to, to the question, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in context. I really feel that historical context and understanding where we are and how we got here uh, really leads to an informed electorate, right? I think oftentimes people, I, I don't know, it's like you speak to them and they think that all this stuff uh, erupted out of a vacuum or something and that this is all new and there's nothing new here, right? This is, this is sort of the point of the film is to connect the dots from 60 years ago. By the way, today, today is the 59th anniversary of the murder of Herbert Lee that we saw in that clip. So he was murdered 59 years ago today just for registering to vote. Okay, like that, that was his big crime. So, you know, I, I, I think that we often lack historical context when having discussions um, amongst ourselves or with people we might disagree with. And I think that understanding how we got here, that, that this is not uh, some new fangled attack that this this is business as usual right and that if you're not paying attention it's easy to get snowed it's easy to get sort of cast to the side before you know it and i think that uh one thing i try to remind people on these panels is that there is no federal 
regulation for voting. We have 50 different laws. We have 50 states with 50 laws and every state has its own regulations. And it's important that everybody know the regulations of their state, right? So we covered North Carolina in my film, uh, Mississippi at the beginning, North Carolina at the end. And North Carolina had a really strong, organized, robust movement to combat what they perceived as uh, onerous voting laws. Uh, other states, not so much. They just kind of get passed right through and, and you know, people wake up one day and all of a sudden there's three more things they got to do to register to vote. You know, and I think that we need, as, as citizens, we need to sort of arm ourselves with um, not alternative facts, but actual facts in historical context. And I, and I really hope that people get that from my film, that when they watch this film, they walk away going, oh, right, you know, that makes a lot more sense now. You know, and I, and I think that um, that was sort of my goal. And I think that I'm trying to get it in front of as many people as I can prior to the election, because it does tend to turn some heads when they see it. Right, I think one of the points that was so clear to me is that it was deliberate. It was deliberate, it was well thought out, you know, and there were clear goals yep. that were articulated unabashedly. Um, by I'm not people. shy about it, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's... And in fact, <laughs> when I watched the film, I remembered at one point hearing, you know, one of these architects of the, these voting restrictions saying, I don't want Black people to have any power over me. Yeah. I mean, it's as blatant as that. And so I just want to remind people, um, we are asking questions of the filmmaker. The film is available for viewing until September 30th. If you haven't yet seen the film, there's a link in the chat box um, with the password. So thank you, Gavin, for making that film available to all of us here uh, in the Sanctuary for Independent Media community. My uh, absolute pleasure. And, and to, to your, if I can just address your, your, your quote about that guy who said he didn't want uh, black people to have agency over him. That was in the, that was in the, that was in the 1960s section, right? And, and so, it's important to understand that in those days, it was, it was clearly black and white. There was no ambiguity about white supremacy being the issue. Now they put it sort of in a very gray zone where they have plausible deniability over everything, right? So they don't, you know, they, 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 they dog whistle the heck out of it. It's a, a election integrity laws, right? They have to combat voter fraud. They, well, the things that they throw out there you know, to someone who's not paying attention, it sounds perfectly reasonable, right? Who doesn't want election integrity? Who's for voter fraud, right? Like these are things that if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't necessarily know that they were racially targeting people, that they were trying to shave off the margins of an electorate to the tune of one or two percent, right? Because if they can keep one or two percent, well, right? That's right? all they need. That's all they need, right? They don't need to win by a million. They need, they need to win by two, right? And that's, and that's the answer. So, you know, that's why I think that if you understand the history, you can actually see these things maybe a little bit more clearly for what they are. Right. And that's what I love about this film is that you connect those dots uh, across the decades and you show that what may look like voter integrity, very benign now, um, really has its roots in white supremacy. Yeah. Um, so I, I deeply appreciate that. Another thing that uh, Branda is making a note of here is that, you know, the phrase make America great again, you know, it's not new. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it, it was a phrase used by Reagan. And for those of you who are, you know, fans of science fiction, it was used by the, uh, you know, the black, uh, you know, novelist Octavia Butler when she uh, wrote her book about a dystopian um, outcome of an election and the disintegration of society where Make America Great Again was the, was the slogan of, of a fictional, uh, you know, autocrat who came to power. So, you know, acknowledging Octavia Butler here as well. Um, any other, do we got questions for the filmmaker here? I hope folks have, have seen the film, but if you haven't, um, there's definitely now a reason uh, to take a look at it because it's, it's, so, mu it's so rich. So rich. In that, in, yes. in that opening opening montage, I tried to show that, right? The Make America Great Again. I, I kind of balanced that with Trump and Reagan. Then you saw Law and Order was Nixon and Trump is the Law and Order candidate. His ideas are not new ideas. The demagogues that he 
that he pulls from, you know, George Wallace, you know, Richard Nixon, these are on purpose. You know, he knows he, you know, he's not original enough or, or bright enough necessarily to come up with this stuff on his own. So he's just pulling from what worked in the past and repurposing it to his, to his needs now. And fear works. Oh yeah. I think that's another thing that we've seen. I, I think back to the election uh, where Michael Dukakis was the Democratic candidate and fear certainly worked in that election. Really working, right. now, oh. you know, we're seeing uh, portraying Democratic cities being violent and he is the only one that can save us from, from these violent mobs. And, and it's like you said, it's, that message is not new, but it is so effective, so effective. Um, other questions for the filmmaker here? Any questions about, you know, the motivation, any of the subjects in the film? Gavin, I'm sure that we're going to have some questions throughout. So I think uh, what we're going to do here, um, well, let's see, do, do any of our co-sponsors, yeah, Branda, go ahead. Can we unmute Branda? Yeah, there you go. I was just wondering if you could talk about Bob Moses and your relationship with Bob Moses in making this film. Sure. Um, so Bob, Bob was the impetus for the film for me. Um, I, I had not heard of Bob Moses until well into my 40s, I think. And I was kind of offended by that, right? I mean, it wasn't until I had read a book called Parting the Waters by Taylor Branch that I was introduced to Bob Moses as a, as a civil rights leader. And, you know, uh, speaking for myself, I mean, we're taught about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and the March on Washington, and that's kind of it. Like maybe a little Malcolm X before we move on to the next subject in history class. And so Bob was very enigmatic, and I was naturally, uh, you know, as a visual effects artist, you know, your eye always goes to what's wrong with the picture, right? If 10 people are walking down the street and one person's limping, that's where your eye goes. It goes to that person. Bob was that guy, like he just stood out in a crowd because he wasn't your typical civil rights leader. He wasn't standing on a soapbox, you know, yelling, follow me and off they go. He, he had a very different way about him that inspired great loyalty because he listened so well. And he, he gave uh, a, a sense of power and agency to illiterate, you know, sharecroppers in Mississippi that made them really feel like they they mattered you know in a way that they were willing to march into fire and one guy says they'd march into hell for bob i have one woman on tape who literally says where she's from in mississippi they still think of him as a god you know like he is that high up in the pantheon of the civil rights movement and so i i felt really fortunate to be able to, to interview him for about six or seven hours and, and really get, you know, a, a really rich version of his, of his memories of events. And he is very, very um, much a historian of his own, in his own right. And he, he's not a very good interview subject. I got to say, <laughs> he just, he talks uh, like I talk like way too much. Right. And he, he takes a long time to get to his answers, which makes it very difficult to edit um, short answers that you're looking for. But um, I, I think it's worth everyone's time to get to know a little bit about him. You know, uh, he, he, he's a MacArthur genius award winner as is Reverend Barber, by the way, because I only hang with MacArthur genius award winners evidently. Um, so, so these guys are really, you know, you know, they're onto something. They're really, uh, they, they, they walk the walk and, you know, they walk the talk, right? Whatever they say they're due. And Bob says that in the movie, right? He says, we're threading an earned insurgency, right? How do I earn my way into the trust of these people? Because, you know, they've heard a lot of talk, right? A lot of people have said a lot of things, but if the first time you get knocked down, you run away. That's what they're expecting you to do. But if you're there for the long haul, they're willing to, to back you. They're willing to, to follow you. And so um, he's, he's, he's really something else. I mean, I, I, I have the movie, just briefly, the, the movie was meant to be a Bob Moses movie. It turned into something else. But one of the things I did for the first 10 or 15 interviews, and I did probably over 50 interviews for this movie, was I got everybody to give me a few minutes of their thoughts on Bob, right? Like, what, like, you know, can you tell me about what you think about Bob? And the things that they said about him 
were, you know, just, just, boy, you wish anybody would say, would talk about you that way, right? Um, Harry Belafonte, I, I, I'm going to put together quite a eulogy when Bob finally passes of all the things that people say about him. In fact, when Julian Bond died and John Lewis died, I always sent Bob a clip of all the things that these people said about him just as a remembrance so that he would understand the, the regard in which he was held. Right, um, it's, it's, it's because you don't want to wait until someone passes. Yeah, but you know, the funny thing is the reason you've never heard of him is probably by design. I mean, he is not a person who seeks the limelight. He is not someone who is a self-promoting person. He does not like award ceremonies. In fact, yeah. we have these anniversaries. Next, this year would have been the 60th anniversary of SNCC. And they were, you know, if not for COVID, would have had a big to do about it. And he makes sure that every time they do that, it's a working meeting. It's always yeah. broken up into groups and action committees. And how do we actually exact change? He's not interested in giving speeches and getting awards. He's like, what are we doing? How do we make this actually into something meaningful? So to that point, Gavin, what are you what are your thoughts about voter suppression this time around? I have to say, with all the news that's been going around, one of the last things I, I saw was, you know, a group of maybe militia men standing outside of an early voting site. Um, what are some of your thoughts on voter suppression broadly? Maybe, I don't know if you've got some thoughts about New York State, but just more broadly. Well, I, 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 I'm obviously I'm not surprised by it. I mean, I, I, I joke, uh, everyone says to me how timely the film is, and I'm like, it'll be just as timely in the next election. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's what they call an evergreen subject. It just, it's forever. And that's kind of the point of the movie. I must confess to not seeing the scuttling of the post office coming, like that was a new one. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, voter intimidation, uh, Alabama had a really good one where they, they made it mandatory to get a state issued ID at the DMV, then they closed all the DMVs in, uh, in the black areas. Right. And it was like, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> right. So they're not terribly subtle. And I think that once that's the key, and, I, and I, I spent a good deal of time in the film explaining the Voting Rights Act and what preclearance is and what that Shelby County decision actually did. Right. And who was covered by it. And now that they don't have anybody to answer to, they don't really much care what you say. Right. It's like you can cry all you want we're in charge. And that's kind of like this, this whole Supreme Court thing that's going on now, right? You can complain all you want. I'm allowed to appoint a new judge 40 days before an election and I'm gonna do it, right? And so as long as there's no recourse for you to challenge them, uh, they, they, they feel no compulsion uh, to, to do the right thing. In North Carolina, I lucked into North Carolina in a bad way and that is the gift that keeps on giving, right? North Carolina just is, is, a, is a ridiculous case for voter suppression and voter fraud, right? If you guys remember in 2018, there was a big voter fraud scandal there where the Republicans harvested absentee ballots and rigged the election for the Republican candidate and they, they wouldn't seat him in Congress. They made them have a new election, right? So the, the idea that the projection right? The idea that Trump would be afraid of voter fraud is because if he'd given the chance, he would do voter fraud, right? I mean, it's like they can't understand that anybody, of course, will do it, you know? Like, it, it's a, it's not a thing. Um, right. Gavin, yet, the, yeah, this is, are, you know? So. And yet here we are. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> so listen, um, this is disturbing. You know, the film's disturbing. What you're just Sorry. talking about is disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've, got, we've got a hopeful question, um, but I'm going to pose it and then I'm going to place it on the agenda later. So I'm going to give you some time to think about it because it right. might take some imagination for you to come up with the answer. And the question is, how are things changing? Um, and, and I'm going to add a little bit to the question. How are things changing? What is different now? What tools do we have now to fight against this? So just keep that question in your mind. We're going to come back to it. Um, and we're going to move on to, uh, to this next part of our, um, of our town hall. And that is voting in 2020. Uh, this is an Ask Me Anything segment. We've got three amazing experts on the line. We've got Pat Jordan from the NAACP, Jennifer Wilson from the League of Women Voters from New York State, and Noah Shutke from the New York Civil Liberties Union. So I am I'm really 
pleased to, uh, to welcome all three of you. And I'm gonna turn this over to Pat for three minutes, Pat, three, and then we'll open it up uh, after the other two panelists go for questions um, and be prepared to be asked anything. Pat. All right. Uh, here I am. Uh, does anyone have a question or do you want me to just start spouting? Uh, just say a few words and then uh, we can pass it on to Jennifer who's going to, you know, give us some really practical, um, you know, changes in the rules this year and then we'll open it up to questions after Noah. Well, what's really important to me is that people know that absent voting absentee is safe. It is safe. It is common. It is what we do. You can do it this year by identifying, uh, just about anybody can do it in New York State this year by identifying COVID, um, temporary illness or disability. And that um, once you request your ballot, make sure it's timely, it turned in time. Once you requ request it now, get it now, send it back now. I requested my ballot several months ago, uh, two months ago, and I got it today. So it's going back out tomorrow because uh, if you, don't know who you're voting for by now, up and down the line, you really need to take two minutes, 10 minutes and read, find out who is running and what, who serves your best interests. Uh, but uh, you can turn in your absentee ballot as soon as you get it, get it back now plan on it. And you don't necessarily have to mail it in. You can set, you can take it in during early voting at the three sites in, in uh, Rensselaer County, which I cannot name for you right now. Um, but you can, there are three sites in Rensselaer County. You can turn it in there. You can turn it in on election day uh, at your polling place. So are my three minutes up yet? Because I'm finished. <laughs> well, thank you, Pat. You're the first person that I've talked to who uh, got her ballot and sent it back. Um, and I want to assure people on this call, this is, um, this is a collaboration. So when Pat says she can't remember the, the, you know, the three addresses off the top of her head, nor should she. There's more important things for you, Pat, to think about. So we're going to put those, uh, that information in the chat box. Where, uh, Jennifer might even tell us those locations, but she doesn't have to. Because again, you know, we have the resource of the chat box um, and the internet. But I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer because I know, because uh, I did an interview with Jennifer on our radio show, the Hudson Mohawk Magazine, a couple days ago, that Jennifer can run you down all the rule changes in three minutes. So, Jennifer, tell us. Actually, what I, I think Pat did a really great job summing them up. But I'm Jennifer Wilson. I'm the deputy director for the League of Women Voters in New York State. And originally, yes, I did tell Corinne, oh, I'll just kind of go over what the new rules are. But Pat, I think you did an excellent job. So I, yes, I will put the, the sites in the chat. But I just have to say, I watched the documentary today. I sat down and I watched it. And it is incredible to the point where I had to change what I wanted to say. It's just such a beautiful look at the national landscape of kind of where we were with voter suppression, where we're at now, and looking really finely at the South. But the whole time I was watching it, I was just thinking, New York State, we're, we're not that much better. We might not have the same issues that we have seen in the South over the years, but it wasn't until last year that we had early voting. You have to register in New York State 25 days ahead of the election. If you want to change your party until last year, you had to do it a year before the primaries to switch your party to vote in a different primary. And as Gavin pointed out, it's 50 states making 50 sets of rules, but here in New York State, our counties run our elections. So it is 62 counties interpreting these laws in 62 different ways. And certainly we saw that last year with early voting with Rensselaer County, very obvious voter suppression of putting the only two early voting sites outside of the largest city and impossible to get to with public transit. So I hope I can answer any questions about how we do have voter suppression, certainly still here in very progressive New York State and also talk about voter education as well. My, my one plug for us is that the Pat's point, yes, you're gonna start getting your ballots soon. And there are a lot of races on the ballots. We are going down to the district level. We're going down to the town level. We've got a lot of DAs up. We have our state assembly, our state Senate. We have our state Supreme Court justices. We have all of our members of Congress. And the League of Women Voters has a nonpartisan tool, vote411.org 
go on there. You can find out all the candidates you're going to see. You can find positions for the candidates. You can find link to their campaign websites, link to their social media. We also ask them policy questions. We can't force them to answer, but we do get a pretty good response rate. So definitely go to vote411.org so that you are ready to vote either by absentee, in-person early voting, or in-person on election day. Great. Jennifer, thank you. Um, Gavin, we're going to go for questions in a second. We're going to turn it over to Noah for three minutes. Um, Noah, you're on. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having me. I feel super honored to be on this panel and kind of uh, um, like bashful about being called an expert. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm representing uh, New York Civil Liberties Union, but I'm not a lawyer, so um, uh, can't speak to a lot of that, but I, but there's plenty of awesome lawyers at the ACLU that can answer your questions about those things. I'm an organizer. It's possible to be both an organizer and a lawyer for sure. I'm just one of them. Um, and, and, and I think that I'll give, there's a lot of people, I'm usually the person on the call trying to give all the voter education, uh, uh, information, but, um, Pat and Jennifer really, um, are covering a, a lot of that. And so I'll just say quickly that we're really focusing on in our campaigns just how to have these conversations about voting with people how to meet people where they're at how to build relationships how to not have it be a transactional um, um relationship between uh you and someone who you want to get to vote um and a lot of the conversations about um that i've that i've um kind of witnessed about voting a lot of the mainstream conversations are are from a place of shame around shaming people into vote. Why aren't uh, um, um, young people voting? Or why aren't um, uh, black people voting in this um, in this uh, area? Well, I think Gavin's um, film does a great job of historicizing what we're talking about here. We're talking about voter suppression. We're talking about a long history of voter suppression of anti-black racism in this country. And I think that um, really framing those conversations. Uh, in that history is super important. And, um, and so our, I'm really trying to shift our, our base at the ACLU away from shame and towards support. How do we give people the tools that they need um, to have accessible pathways to the polls? This means accessible digital voter tools, uh, accessible, um, um, easy, to, easy to use, um, easy to read information, uh, easy to get information about how to get to the polls um, or, or how to or vote by mail, as, as, as Pat mentioned. Um, and um, I'll also just say that the, the one that we're running, a lot of groups are doing a lot of great work around this and we're running a relational organizing campaign, which is really, how do you talk to your friends and family about, um, about getting to the polls? How do you use your networks um, to do that? Um, and uh, as someone asked about poll monitoring, super and voter protection, obviously super important, especially as we're gonna see even a more of an uptick of right wing uh, white nationalist violence probably around the election um, and after the election. So, um, so a, a common cause is doing some awesome work around that as well as um, working family parties and movement for black lives are, are teamed up and are, and are training um, what they're calling, to, what they're calling democ democracy defenders to be out at the polls. Um, I'll just say really oh, quickly about that is so fantastic. Is that three minutes? It was, oh, and I'm minutes. also really okay, cool. I'm really curious about the democracy defenders. So I hope you can stay on until the end because I want to come back when we talk about mutual aid and we talk about um, you know next steps, real like putting this stuff in practice. I want to make sure that people have those resources. I myself want to want to get on that train with democracy defenders i want to tell people that you can ask questions in the chat box um, i know gavin's got a question i'm gonna use the privilege of the chair for a moment and ask my own but also there's uh all the resources that jennifer is putting up in the chat box are fantastic the addresses for the early voting sites the accessibility for people living with disabilities, really important stuff. Um, my first question, Jennifer, is that if you are watching on Facebook Live or um, if you can't see the chat box, where is the best place for people to go for information about um, where to vote, where their polling place is, where their early voting sites are, and can you tell us what voter registration deadline? What's the deadline? 
Oh, that's a good one. I can, I'll look that up while I answer the other ones. <laughs> so <laughs> our website, lwbny.org, we have a voting page with FAQs for all the questions Corinne asked, including a full like look at every county. And then this specific information about accessibility, about public transit, we actually source that. So we reach out to the poll sites to make sure that that information is correct, because that might not necessarily be readily available on the County Board of Elections website. But of course, you can go to your County Board of Elections website, or you can go to lwvny.org. And your deadline to register to vote is November, or I'm sorry, October 9th. So we're getting close. And someone did ask me in the chat how you can do that online. And fortunately, this is a classic example of New York is progressive, but really we're behind. The only way to register online right now is through the DMV. So dmv.ny.gov, if you have a license or state ID, but as we know, many people do not have a license or a state ID, and we're finding this is a particular issue in New York City, but certainly in cities upstate, this is an issue as well. We did pass a law to allow for online voter registration. It has not taken effect yet, so it is very frustrating, especially during COVID, that we are having a really hard time trying to get people registered in time for this October 9th deadline. And surprise, surprise, Anastasia is telling us that the uh, the DMV for New York, the voter registration is not working. So uh, not a surprise, Anastasia, thank you for telling us that. Um, you know, it happens, right? But then why does it happen? Is it, you know, you wonder. Um, Gavin, you had a question. Uh, more of a comment to Jennifer's point about New York not being much better than the South. Uh, so section five, which was the pre-clearance regime, covered most of the Confederate states, but guess what? It also covered Queens, New York, right? And it covered a couple of counties in upstate New York as well. So if you were a locality that had a history of voter suppression and racialized voter suppression of that, you were gonna be forced to run your voting laws through the federal government and New York was in that group, right? I mean, parts of New York were in that group. It wasn't the whole state, but you know, little dotted counties in New York were definitely part of that. And then just a shout out to the ACLU is that, you know, uh, Dale Ho, obviously, who is the head of the Voting Rights Project for the ACLU is uh, featured heavily in the movie as well. So uh, big props. Uh, he's, I, I often bring him, try to get him to come on panels, but he's always arguing a case somewhere about something. So I, I, don't, I don't begrudge he's him. Busy, he's a busy man. He's a busy um, man. Noah, Noah, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, I think. This is a good spot to just plug that um, a little bit past the election, but um, the, the New York Voting Rights Act, which which would be a comprehensive uh, bill um, in, in New York State, it's it's now renamed the John R. Lewis Voting Rights uh, New York Voting Rights Act, which would be the most progressive uh, voting rights act in in the country uh, that that um, New York Civil Liberties Union just helped write and. So look, look, you know, look forward to different ways to support that come January. But really, it's to address the um, uh, racial discrimination and uh, history of racial discrimination and voting in um, in New York as, as like an overhaul bill. So I just want to mention that. Thank you so much. If you get a chance, um, if there's any information that you could plug into the chat box about that, we'll collect that resource and pass it on. Listen, when the when the New York Civil Liberties Union uh, writes a bill like that and then has a powerful group like this to call on as allies, we know we can get stuff done, right? Because New York became a state that allowed for early voting far too late. Um, we are a state that had um, early voting and then our local officials put the early voting sites outside of downtown Troy, uh, totally inaccessible last year. So what happened? A lot of the folks on this call People in this group, our co-sponsors for this event, fought that and worked with Senator Neil Breslin to pass a bill to make sure that early voting sites are more accessible in Troy. This stuff can be fought, um, but it has to be done together in coalition. So Noah, thank you. And thank you for all, Jennifer, the League, uh, all of you guys for, for making sure that that Senator Breslin bill got passed. Um, all right. So you may think that I'm rushing you. I am because we're going to take a five minute break stretch, grab a glass of water. We're going to hear some music for a second, then we're going to come back and talk about what's at stake. Why should you vote? Five minutes, folks. Come back. Steve, hit the music. Hopefully we have music.
I could play some music. I'm going to call us back into this space. God, that was a beautiful song. I thought it was a historical song. And then I, and then I heard the lyrics. The president sang Amazing Grace. And I, oh, I don't know if I needed that or it was hard or what, but it was beautiful. Steve, thank you for picking that song. It's called The President Sang Grace by the Kronos Quartet with Mechlet. Hey, did the Kronos Quartet play at the Sanctuary <clears throat> at Media not too long ago? I don't think so, but Mechlet sang at the Sanctuary um, yeah. as a solo artist and also as part of the Nile Project a few years ago. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much, Steve, for playing that song. And thank you for everyone uh, coming back into the space with us tonight, uh, because now we're going to turn our attention to what's at stake. Um, a few weeks ago, Eileen and I had a discussion about how 
We need, you know, we're nonpartisan at the sanctuary. Let's make that very clear. We are nonpartisan um, and we are uh, interested in providing information about um, how to vote and why it's important. But gosh darn it, you know, we got to vote like our lives depend on it this time around because they do. So what we did is we found some speakers that could speak to how important that is and why our lives depend on voting. And we've collected them for you here tonight. So I am really honored to introduce these speakers. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna introduce them and ask them to speak uh, for three minutes and then we'll move on to the next speaker and then we'll open it up for questions. So our first speaker uh, is Anastasia Robertson. She is a former city council person with the Troy City Council. Um, District 2, and she's going to speak for three minutes on voting to build local political power because it's not just about the federal election. That's the sexiest part, um, but the things that affect our everyday lives happen at the local level. So that's another reason why voting is so important. Anastasia, take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, good evening. Thank you, everyone, for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, voting and why it's important on the local level. Well, first, let me say a couple of things. Um, one, yes, I am um, an ex city council person, but I'm also here as a member of Troy for Black Lives. Um, we reached a consensus that that would be okay. It is said that we need to vote as if our lives depended on it. But sadly, when it comes to the black vote, it doesn't really seem to make much difference. To kind of paraphrase Martin Luther King, he says, I think I've led my people into a burning house. Where unfortunately, between electoral votes, gerrymandering, um, tearing down voting rights laws, and, and all the effort that's put in to keep people from voting, we kind of wonder at times, what is exactly the advantage? We also wonder, when we look at the candidates, who serves the interests of Black people? And that's pretty much no one. And Black people, we have decided, of, uh, kind of feel like voting doesn't really serve us a great purpose. Um, we're tired of picking from the lesser of two evils. And that's the, way it is. that's the way it is. Unfortunately, this is the only system that is in place currently in this country where you might have a voice. So I've voted all of my adult life. I've never missed an election, local or general or presidential or otherwise. However, even I question sometimes. And it's really hard to sit down and talk to people, whether they're my age or older or younger, to find the value in the vote when we're always constantly on the losing end and we are constantly battling for a voice. And we're met at every turn with everything but the kitchen sink. And it's really hard to have faith in, in a system that was never meant for us. So when we talk about voting as if our lives depended on it, Whose life are we referring to? We can't have, the black vote cannot be the vote that saves everybody but itself. It's the black vote that everybody wants to get Trump out of office. But it's not a black vote that helps us in any way. And so we're faced with a dilemma of having one system to choose from, a system that is so corrupt on the local level all the way up to the White House, that people don't even want to entertain the thought of running for an office these days, especially here in the city of Troy where I live. They're not interested. And it's not that they're not interested because you're not interested. You're not interested because you are constantly met with one fireball after the other, no matter what you do. There's an old boy system, old girl system, whatever you would like to call it, that's in play. And it's on every level. We have an electoral college that, uh, electoral vote that wipes away the individual vote, just wipes it clean out. 
And the sad thing is, all of us are in the same boat. We just don't seem to recognize it. But it really hurts Black people the most. So I, 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 I sit here with some confidence in the system, but probably about as much confidence as the majority of Black people who we, we want to participate. We want to find the right way. We want to make sure that legislation and so forth works on behalf of all people. But when you keep leaving black people out of the equation and keep beating them over the head constantly and then expect them to save everybody from Trump, it's just wrong. So hopefully by being a part of this conversation, I will learn some things from other people. Other people might get a better understanding of how this affects the, the willingness to vote they say we didn't turn out the last vote, but people didn't turn out the last vote. They didn't want to vote. It's not because, it's because the system is working just as, it's, as it was designed. Mm. It's broken. Wise, wise. Yeah, Anastasia, thank you so much. I'm sure we're gonna have uh, another chance to hear from you. I just wanna, I just want to thank you from this community for holding it down with the rest of Troy Black Lives at the courthouse this thank you. two weeks, you know, and no justice, right? No justice. And yet, and yet we call on you to save us again, right? Even here tonight. Thank you for holding it down at the courthouse. Thank you for everyone who uh, went down there with Troy for Black Lives. Um, thank you. Really important words. Um, so think of some questions for Anastasia, or maybe just um, a lot of thanks are coming in. I don't know if you can see that chat box, but a lot of thanks coming into you. Eileen, my friend, can you, uh, Eileen is from our nature lab at the Sanctuary for Independent Media, and I, Eileen is going to talk for three minutes, right, Eileen, about <laughs> what yes. stake for Latinx voters, as if you can sum that up in three minutes. And uh, what's at stake for the health and welfare of our environment and our very bodies. So take it away. Okay. Um, well, the Latino community has been affected the most with the pandemic, as well as the people of color, like Anastasia said. So those are the two um, um, people that have been affected the most with this current situation. So if Latinos, and I'm old fashioned, I still say Latinos, but it's Latin X, uh, is still doubt, have any doubt that we need to make a change in the current administration. There are some things that we need to focus on. The current state of the country, like the film, in the film says, the people united never be defeated. That is a slogan that most countries that have experienced corruption, Latino countries that have experienced corruption, have always said, el pueblo unido jamás será vencido. So this is something that across the board, everybody has been in protest in countries that Latinos have fled, not because of socialism, like the current president have said, anybody that flee a country doesn't flee because of free education and free health care. People flee countries and Latinos flee countries because of corruption and in a dictatorship. And since 2016 up to now, all we have is division, hatred, crimes, rioting, um, inequalities, um, no health care, but not way of uh, working the system to provide it. So Latinos can make a difference in this election if we turn out to vote because we are the largest minority in the country. However, just like Anastasia said, Latinos are not really either being contacted by democratic parties, but also not interested because there's a constant struggle that people have no faith. So yes, voting in this election is basically voting as your life depends on it. 
because if you had any doubts, just look at the last six months and see the pandemic. And I bet you that 50% of Latinos know somebody that either has been affected by the pandemic because somebody died and you know, or you are affected because now you don't have any resources. Latinos are essential workers, yet they not have the consideration of the importance that they bring to this country. So this November 3rd, if you don't care for the first time, show up, make a difference, and see the balance. Look what you left. Those countries that you supposedly left because of socialism, do you really leave it because of it? Or do you leave it because of the power struggle. There is a famous phrase, all Latinos might know it, one hand washes the other one. Basically, a person like the current president has many people that he has put in positions of power. So what happened is he put these people in positions of power because if he gets in trouble, he can say, remember when I give you this job? Now you owe me. That's exactly what dictators and corrupted government in Latino countries have said. And again, like um, Corinne said, my opinion is my personal opinion. I'm not representing the sanctuary for independent media. This is my opinion. Yes, I'm voting for Biden and I hope you too. So Latinos showed up, the necesitamos. And another thing that I wanna say before my minute is up, there is something very important. Please contact the Latino Capital District, the census. We cannot allocate funds to cities if we do not count how many people are in each city. So I'm gonna say in Spanish, si estás aquí escuchando esto y hablas español, eso es para ti. El censo es muy importante. No podemos pedir más dinero del gobierno si no estás contado como un miembro de la ciudad y el estado que vives. Dos cosas hoy, vete a votar y por favor, ve y llena el censo. Los latinos contamos, eso te necesitamos hoy. Gracias, thank you. <laughs> Gracias, Eileen. Thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, Eileen brought up the pandemic. I just listened to NPR talking about, you know, people getting outrageous bills for post-pandemic, uh, you know, post-COVID care. So we invited Katie Robbins <laughs> from the New York Campaign for Health uh, on this call tonight, and I am so excited to introduce you all um, to my new friend, Katie. Katie, tell us about your work and what's at stake in this election. Take yourself off mute first before you start. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, hang on. Except you're very echoey. You have two mics on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the technical difficulties on my end, but um, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on this panel and especially, you know, to follow up the really, really powerful comments from Anastasia and Eileen um, about the complexity of this question about what's at stake. Um, my work is specifically on healthcare and uh, I work with an organization campaign for New York Health, which pushes for legislation for universal guaranteed health care in New York State, really wanting New York State to live up to that progressive reputation and have a health care system that truly guarantees care to everyone, regardless of income, regardless of employment status, regardless of immigration status or marital status. Um, and we know we have the wealth and the resources to do that in New York State and in the country. Um, and in this moment that we're in right now, in the middle of this devastating pandemic, um, I think there's never been really more clarity on the fragmentation and dysfunction and inequality of the current status quo for healthcare. Um, when just as you may need healthcare the most, you also are faced with the likelihood of losing your job and with that, your health insurance, right? I have a feeling that everybody here 
has experienced hardship through this time or knows people that they are close to who have experienced hardship related to not just the public health crisis, but the economic crisis that we have. Um, healthcare is so deeply personal. Um, and it's really a shame that we continue to be the outlier in developed countries that leave millions of people completely uninsured. Um, I believe the numbers of how many people who have lost insurance is around 6 million in this pandemic. Um, several hundred thousand in New York State. Though I think when the numbers like next year when we really get the full look, it's going to be much more severe than that. Um, and so it's shocking that with the system that we have that results in hospitals, the private academic health centers and private insurance companies making record profits. Uh, we have people going bankrupt from the kind of bills they're getting for COVID treatment. You know, I know someone personally whose sister was in the hospital for COVID. She got a, a bill for $200,000. Um, and these kinds of cases, of course, existed before the pandemic, but the scale is really, really increasing. And of course, we see um, the people who are hit hardest are those who are um, fighting the systemic racism in this country all the time. Black and brown people have been hit hardest by um, the, the disease, COVID-19, and also the economic hardship. Um, so really, in order to have a just recovery, from this pandemic, we need to center universal health care as a policy response, making health care a guaranteed right. That's, you know, the right thing to do. It's absolutely critical um, for, I think, an economic recovery um, so that people can survive and know they can get the care they need without going bankrupt. Um, and in New York, we think we'll have the political will to do it if we have the people's movement behind us. So I'm really privileged to work on this um, state bill, but also on the national level, we're looking at um, a Supreme Court hearing um, on the Affordable Care Act. Um, November 8th, I believe, is when the oral arguments are heard right after the election. So everything is very intricately linked with the nomination of the next Supreme Court justice, this hearing. And if the ACA is thrown out, um, we will see millions of people lose their health insurance through either the private market or the Medicaid expansion and many other um, important policy gains that we made totally reversed around pre-existing conditions, the donut hole for Medicare. It's a very, very scary landscape. And when it comes to health care, I think we can safely say um, your vote, we need to vote like our lives depend on it because they do. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Katie, Katie I, we'll, get we'll, get to, we'll get to this question uh, at the end, but I just wanna do a little preview here. Both you and Anastasia perfectly illustrated why, um, you know, why our vote matters right here in New York, in the capital region. You know, it is the state legislature that's gonna pass on your campaign about whether we get universal health care in New York State. And Anastasia, you know, it's the district attorneys, man. It is so important that we come out and we realize that the district attorneys are, are the ones that are, are making some of the most damaging decisions about criminal justice. And it, it's not gonna solve the problem for sure, um, we have so much work to do to get rid of white supremacy, but first we got to get rid of these DAs, you know? Again, not partisan, but some DAs that are doing us wrong have got to go, you know? All right, listen, who do we have next? Young people. Wow, so important. I have to admit to you, I know zero about the People's Perception Project, um, but I'm really excited to learn about it. Um, and I think that we ought to turn a lot of our space over to young people. I'm just going to turn three minutes of our space over to young people right now. So Sierra Sangetti Daniels and Eric Kossoff, can you um, drop some knowledge for us? Yeah, thank you so much for having us. My name is Eric Kossoff. I'm Sierra Sangetti Daniels. Yeah, and uh, we, uh, we just started our project, People's Perception Project, last year. And, and really what our work revolves around is heavily youth-centered and also community-oriented. Um, I'm a teacher. I've been an educator for six years. 
I stepped out of this space to uh, do this work with Sierra, who you want to tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a journalist and I also stepped out of my space uh, for similar reasons from Eric. I felt that I wasn't really getting the work done that I wanted to. And, you know, maybe by leaving the space, I would be able to do a little bit more. So I don't know if you want to. Yeah, so I guess like after a little background on us, um, to dive in talking about the youth, well, like to me, schools are very much so uh, some of the most incredibly populated areas with community and when one area in a town. This is literally the children from a town going to a school from K through 12. They are there for most of the year, more than they're at home. And we should be using these spaces to produce citizens and a good citizenry and instead it's failing our students and failing the youth I mean it should fire everybody up and that's just what's happening in our school systems right now. Uh, our government should be interacting with students, the community should be interacting with students. Instead what was happening is our students are bogged down by skill-based assessments exams such as the regents that are preventing them from becoming involved in any way in our democracy and but what we're teaching them upholds the idea that voting is the only way to get involved. That's why I'm really passionate about things um, similar to lowering the voting age to 16. That's something I fight for because it shows students you can get involved, you are paying taxes if you're working, you should get out there and vote. And I believe teachers should be fighting against these standard base exams. And I think right now we're at a time with Corona when those exams are possibly being taken out of the picture again. So I'm very much so encouraging teachers in these spaces to not continue to teach skills that uphold white supremacy and perpetuate those skills in our country. Um, and I think these are a little bit of the things that we can do to help get the youth more involved and understand that they can be involved without voting. Go to your school budget meetings, go to all of these different things. The youth are just as much a part of this as we are and we just gotta be teaching that. And if we start teaching it young, then who knows what's gonna be happening when they grow up. Yeah, and kind of kind of going off of that and looking at the education as like a key center for change. I mean, as a journalist, I definitely see the media as one of those key centers for change. And I think when we're talking about voting and why marginalized communities, specifically the Latinx or the black marginalized communities, LGBTQ voters, are you know, maybe not showing up. It's that they don't feel connected to the community that they live in. They don't feel connected to the country that they live in. And a big part of why they don't feel connected is because they're not accurately represented in the media. So I think when we're talking about, like we're having conversations around voting, we're having conversations about redefining what civic engagement is. For me, that means looking at your local news, analyzing that local news and demanding better. Because when I was in the local news, I saw that there were very specific groups of people that were left out and no surprise to anyone in this room, of course they were the marginalized communities. So I think kind of having this expectation, and Anastasia spoke about this a little bit, of having this expectation that you know black people are gonna continue to be our saviors, although we're getting no reward for it, is if I don't see myself in the media, if I don't see myself as having these you know, positions of, of prominency in our nation, then no, I'm not gonna go out and vote because there mean, that means that there's no one in there kind of rooting for me. Um, so I just, yeah, as an overall wrap up, I think that, you know, like we think it's People's Perception Project, we work with journalists and educators because the media and education system right now are extremely flawed. And until we look at those as two key centers for change, I don't know if we're gonna see the, the, the you know, reactions and the responses from, you know, the, the, the ballot box that we're all here to kind of hope that we do see. Thank but you. thank you for inviting us yeah. and letting <laughs> us speak. Sierra, what a great point you just made. I mean, you know, we could be, gathering together on a town hall like this in about, you know, what, a month, like a month, a little over a month from now, not having gotten the result that many of us want. And then what's the work? And then what does the work look like? How do we all work together? Um, yeah, how do we work together in that case? So thank you for that. And I, I also just want to point out, um, uh, Eric, their NPR just did a story today on why it's so important to raise the, the voting age or lower the voting age to 16. Not only does it give young people power, but it also, uh, it also the research shows that it, 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 it develops lifetime voters, a habit of voting. You know, people are, we're losing out on your voices, on young people's voices, because, you know, at 18, there's a lot going on in young people's lives. Start them soon, you know, start them when they're getting that civic education. Anyway, I could talk for hours, but I'm not going to because we're running out of time. Um, our next speaker is Ali uh, Schaefing from BirthNet. And Ali and I were having a discussion about reproductive justice this afternoon. So Ali, tell us why from your perspective, voting is, uh, we have to vote like our lives depend on it.
Yeah, thank you so much, Corinne. Um, it's a real honor to be here and to um, be a part of this panel. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing from everyone. So I'm here on behalf of BirthNet, a local nonprofit based in the South End in Albany um, that's focused on what we call birth justice and what a lot of folks nationwide are calling birth justice. Um, it's basically motiva motivated by the horrific uh, racial disparities in birth experiences and outcomes um, in the capital region and beyond. So um, when we say that, we're, we're talking really specifically about maternal and infant mortality and morbidity rates among black women and babies in our area, which are uh, horrific. And um, this needs to be addressed, needs to be attacked um, from a lot of ways through a lot of channels. But uh, one of those ways, one of the really key ways is political action and advocacy. Uh, we feel we need structural and systemic changes to laws and policies and leadership. Uh, voting is one of the most immediate and widespread ways to work towards those changes. Um, and if we think, you know, what are the political and legal opportunities to restructure our systems towards birth justice? Um, one recent example is um, the idea of providing insurance coverage for doula and doula services. Um, so a doula is a professional support person for pregnant people and their families. They provide physical, emotional, informational support. Um, they're awesome. And um, they most often provide continuous labor support. And studies show again and again that this, um, having a doula, having continuous labor support, non-medical support, leads to drastic improvement in birth outcomes and experiences. And the highest rates of improvement are actually among minority populations. So this has potential to be really impactful and it's very available. Um, however, it's uh, not covered by insurance um, in New York State it can cost $1,000 easily out of pocket. Um, however, in 2019, New York piloted insurance reimbursement through Medicaid for doula services, which is a really big deal. It puts us among like the top three states in support of um, doula services and birth justice. And this was all part of the governor's um, kind of roundtable reproductive justice um, movement task force. So. Um, we have had the opportunity to be a part of that as an organization, um, and that's just one like immediate way. So it was piloted last year, 2019, in Kings, Kings County and Erie County, um, and the hope is that it will scale up and private insurance will get involved. Um, it's not perfect. They need more input from the community. Um, shocking, but they, uh, they plan to do that, and that's, you know, another example of a state-level political action that we think is really necessary. Um, there's also opportunity to advocate for training um, in hospitals and in medical schools and addressing implicit bias and systemic racism and do some anti-racism work as part of what's required for medical training um, and paid maternity and paternity leave are just a few examples of how we feel political action is really important to our work towards birth justice. Um, and I just want to close by echoing what Corinne said in the beginning that it's been a really horrible week um, for a lot of our loved people of color and for um, a lot of marginalized groups. It's been a bad month, it's been a bad year. Um, and I'm just honored to be here on behalf of my uh, colleagues from BirthNet um, who are the real leaders of the work and they're at the center of the work. And I try to be an ally. Um, I'm a doula, I'm a parent, and I'm a voter. So thank you for having me. Hey, Allie, thank you so much. Um, we're running behind because I just couldn't cut people off. You all said too many important things. Um, we're gonna jump really quickly into this mutual aid segment. And I know that there are some questions that people still have. We're gonna get to them. But I wanna do, uh, you know those um, game shows where they do rapid fire? We're gonna do rapid fire resources. I wanna remind people that there are a lot of resources being shared in the chat box, but I'm gonna call on people to tell me what you're doing to get out the vote and how we can help you. Um, so I'm going to call on Renee. Uh, Renee Powell, we haven't heard your voice yet, um, and I want to hear it. So tell me what you're doing and how we all can help. Okay, so uh, I want to first off thank everyone for participating and, and sharing uh, a lot of good information. Um, what the NAACP is doing, along with the other uh, uh, branches in the capital region, one of the uh, main things we're doing is m making sure that we get people registered to vote. 
And we're not just stopping there. We're also working on making sure we get people to the polls as well. And in the meantime, we want to make sure that they understand what they're voting for. I, I've found that through conversation with folks during the registration part, that they are uncertain about what to do, thus they don't do anything. So I'm, my thought is that, you know, if you have a little bit of knowledge that may help you uh, move a little more forward um, in, in terms of voting. Um, and so at this point, those are the things that we're focusing on in terms of voter registration. The other key part that's very important is participation in the census. Because after the vote is over, there's going to be some activity going on involving redistricting, fund allocation to the various communities, um, decisions made uh, dealing with housing, education. And so we, the main thing that we're working on is getting people to participate. So my ask to all of you is that if you see five people, whether you know them or not, check them and make sure they, you know, filled out their census. Um, the other piece, also ask them, did you register to vote? And we've talked about how to get that done. We've listed resources here, and we'll also list the resource for um, completing the census. This is something that they can do on their own, on their cell phone, or on their computer laptop. Um, but we've got to, you know, get those numbers in, get the counts going, because it's, it's very important um, to have that information and to have that representation. Um, and I was, I was in a meeting and someone was saying that they didn't feel as though the numbers really represented them. And that could be very true. If you don't um, put your numbers in there, then you will not be represented. So, um, and that has been a problem in the past. We just don't participate. Therefore, we are not represented. Um, we are knowledgeable now. We know better, so we should do better, um, we, and we need to participate. So um, that is the main thing that we're doing is trying to reach out to the community to basically help people help themselves by exercising their right to vote and making sure that they are counted. And, um, and we're working on that via grassroots, you know, person to person. Um, we're going around to different events, uh, setting up and having conversations with individuals. And, um, and basically, that, that's about all that we're doing right now. Great. Renee, can you uh, either put in the chat box or just say out loud how people can get connected to the NAACP um, to help out? Okay, so with the Troy branch, uh, you can co connect with us via email at troynynaacp.org, I'm sorry, uh, at gmail.com, and I will put that in the chat. Um, you can also um, DM, DM us on um, Facebook, and if you want to go to the national level, uh, you can find more information at the national level at naacp.org, and I will also put that in the chat as well. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, Troy, N-Y, N-A-A-C-P at gmail.com. Thank Correct. you. Correct. Renee, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I am gonna ask rapid fire again, because we have to, we wanna have time for questions and I, I know Gavin has some things that he wants to say and I wanna hear them. Um, but Jennifer and Noreen, can you tell us a little bit about the League of Women Voters activities, including the candidates forum and the minister's ride pro minister. Tell us about, about what you're doing. <laughs> um, Noreen, I'll let you say everything going around Salir. I just want to drive one point home on the census and thank you for everyone who brought it up. The deadline to reply to the census is the 30th. So it's like, it's the most important thing to take away from this. Like, yes, voting's coming, but don't forget the deadline to apply is like a week away. So December 30th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I, um, I just like to say, um, we have been approached by the league has been approached by a family in Troy that has offered to pay for buses to 
uh, take folks uh, from the west side of Troy, downtown, the heart of Troy, to uh, early voting sites um, at the uh, Arminian Hall and probably Brunswick, the closest ones to us. Um, we are meeting with, uh, we, we want to try to do this through the, uh, the pastors in the community, and we have been meeting with them for the past uh, couple of weeks. We're meeting tomorrow to go over logistics. I mean, the issue is because of the, the fact that, um, you know, many of us now, because of COVID, can uh, vote by absentee ballot. We're trying to ascertain whether or not there is an interest in people going, actually going uh, to vote in person to early voting. And so um, that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Um, I'll have more information about it um, after tomorrow, but hopefully uh, we will be able to um, put this in motion. Um, early voting is really, really important. Uh, we We've, the league has worked for this. Uh, Jennifer, you can attest to this for over the past 30 years. It got passed by the legislature in uh, early 19, uh, 2019. We were very hopeful that um, our county board of commissioners would establish an early voting site in Troy, you know, the largest municipality in Rensselaer County, and they did not. And both commissioners, uh, supported the fact that they were going to put early voting sites in Brunswick and Skodik and not in Troy. And uh, we've been fighting that ever since. Hopefully, um, you know, if we, if we, if we um, try to get the press involved and uh, get some um, uh, attention to the fact that people are going to be bussed to early voting sites, you know, this maybe goes back to Gavin's, um, you know. Uh, yeah, not an accident, right, Gavin? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, here, we, here we are, what, 50, 60 years later, and we're still fighting, you know, the same voter suppression that we saw back in the, um, you know, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and we still have it today. And it is alive, folks, right here in Rensselaer County, I hope. Um, we can get folks registered and get out the vote and Reverend um, Barber says you can, you can do to help get that done. I, you know, we all appreciate it. Reverend Barber says it may not be Jim Crow, but it's his grandson, James Crow Esquire, the <laughs> third. <laughs> yes. Noreen quickly or Jennifer, one of you. Um, I know that your efforts to get people to the polls with rides is under development. Um, but where can people go if they want to help you or if they have people that they know need help or if they want to learn more. Jennifer, this might be another time to plug 411, but tell us how to get in touch with you. Yeah, so our electronic ballot website is vote411.org if you want to learn about candidates. We also have candidate debates going on all throughout the capital region, which Noreen could maybe speak more about, or go to the website lwvny.org. You can find Rensselaer's website there as well. So yes, get educated on the candidates because it's very important to know who we're actually voting for this year. And Noreen, how can people find out about your efforts uh, driving people to the polls? Yeah, we're, we are definitely going to get the word out as soon as we come up you know, we, uh, tomorrow we're meeting, we will come up with a plan and then we're definitely going to do advertising and get the word out. How can we get in touch with you? We've got a lot of organizers on the phone. I mean, on this call, on this meeting. Uh, through the uh, League of Women Voters website for- Fantastic. For yeah. And that's, uh, tell me the website name again. Oh, gee. Oh, oh no. All right. Somebody's going to put it in the chat box. Yeah. We're going to move on though. Thank you, Noreen. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, I would like to, Russell Sage College is right down the street from me. I am really excited about all the activities that Russell Sage is doing with their students. And we've got the wonderful Jeff Miller on uh, our town hall. Thank you for coming, Jeff. Tell us what you're doing with the students. Well, thank you so much, Corinne, and thank you, everybody. Um, one, just a quick question, actually. Do you think we could get an email together at following this conversation with some of the resources we're talking about? Because there's just, there's so much, and it's all so good. And I want to make sure that uh, everybody has access to that. Yeah, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk to the to the powers that be and see if we can do that. Because you're right, there's a lot 
a lot going on here in the chat box. Um, a lot, but stuff. all very good. Really good stuff. Tell us what you guys are doing. Yeah, thanks so much, Corinne. So uh, you, we, we talked uh, about two weeks ago, um, uh, SAGE is really engaging students in the political process. Uh, as Corinne mentioned a little while ago, we believe in the power of young people at Russell Sage College and we're committed to creating spaces that empower them to be active in their democracy. So this fall, we are really focusing on providing programs that engage our community in civic engagement, uh, from celebrating 100 years of the suffrage movement to bringing today's politicians to our students. And we're again, we're very committed to ensuring that our students can vote. Uh, so our student portion is uh, Sage Votes. It's a comprehensive nonpartisan initiative whose mission is to promote student voter registration, participation, and awareness through on-campus and virtual activities. Uh, one of the activities I really want to highlight to this group because, uh, you know, we saw Gavin's film and um, it brought up a lot of relevant points. Uh, we are, are also uh, ha have a program um, called uh, Rigged. So we're going to be doing a virtual viewing of Rigged, the voter suppression playbook uh, to learn how strategic intentional voter suppression tactics from purging voting rolls and restrictive voter ideas, ID laws to gerrymandering and voter intimidation and how they undermine our democracy. So that is an open event. Uh, and then following the film, uh, we're going to be hearing from Awosu Inane, who is an Albany City Council member, Sam Fine, who's an Albany County legislator, and our uh, alum, Therese McClammon, who is running for State Senate. And they'll talk about uh, focusing in the larger picture of uh, institutional voter suppression and really looking at it from a local perspective. Uh, and then we also have our Women's Institute, which was created to respond to the contemporary and evolving cultural landscapes of the 21st century, honoring Russell Sage College's century-long dedication to women empowerment. So we have two really great programs coming up. Uh, on October 8th, uh, we have Vanguard, How a Black Woman Have How Black Women Have Always Led the Voting Rights. Uh, and that's a lecture from Martha S. Jones, who's with the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at John Hopkins. Uh, and then on Tuesday, October 20th, we'll have the role of Indigenous people in women's suffrage. And this will feature Sally Roche Wagner, who is the author of Sisters in Spirit, uh, Influences on American Feminist. Um, so we have a lot of great programs. Uh, again, I'm hoping that we can share all of this with everybody in a follow-up because uh, I think everybody here is here for the same reason that I am, uh, because voting rights matter and uh, we have to have value ourselves with the vote. So uh, I'm so happy to be here with everybody tonight and I look forward to connecting with you all later. Jeff, amazing. I, I am so excited about this programming that you've put together for your students and for the community. So thank you. And I, you. I, I can't wait to check it out myself. We've got two more resources uh, that we want to share before we move into a couple of questions that we can take before we wrap up. Um, Pat Jordan, do you want to tell us about Albany District Links? Oh, you're on mute, Pat. Albany District Links is, thank you so much for the opportunity. Albany District Links is an international organization of uh, uh, mostly professional women of color. Uh, we are a service organization. We do what we can in our community. Uh, we are linked in friendship and in service to our community. So in the past, the links have run food drives. We've held, um, uh, educational opportunities. We've run uh, something called Math Sprint in uh, schools in the uh, in the uh, capital region, which was a really wonderful, wonderful program until the coronavirus stopped us. And we were helping kids to understand that they are math whizzes. They just have to try a little bit harder. And we treated math as it as if it were an intramural sport, and the kids loved it. Uh, so links. Uh, you'll see us every once in a while popping up doing some kind of community service around the capital region. Oh man, that sounds so great. It reminds me of what somebody once said. It's like when a kid says I'm no good at math, what you should say back to them is who ruined it for you, right? Yeah. I wish somebody had said that to me. Um, thank you, Pat, for the work that you're doing. You're very welcome. Um, 
Melissa, uh, Melissa Bromley with the sanctuary. She's been on the back end doing a lot of tech support tonight, but she, uh, Melissa, can you talk about the canvassing work uh, that we're, that you're doing? Yes. If you are feeling inspired after all of this and you want to help make it easy for people to vote, please come join uh, me and Noreen and some other folks. Eileen's going to be there uh, and Frank, who's not here right now, but is part of the Sanctuary's Health Autonomy Project. Uh, we are going to be out in Freedom Square from noon to 4 p.m. on Sunday with coffee and biscotti. Come and just hang out, answer people's questions, and we'll have the paperwork and know-how to let people know how uh, they can be empowered to vote this year. Amazing, and um, how, so it's just show up. Can you tell people where and when again? Yes, uh, you can certainly just show up, but I've put in the chat a form. Uh, if you're interested, fill out the form. It's just your name and email address, and that way uh, I can send you a reminder. Great. So um, I think that people, uh, I think the people in this town hall are reading some of the same stuff I am, and there's some scary stuff going on about uh, what's going to happen, you know, the day after the election or the week after, or, you know, we may not know until January. We're being warned not to, you know, not to think that we need to know the results of, of the election that night. Um, it's scary. It's scary out there. And I heard who? Uh, I heard Noah talk about democracy defenders, and I'm super interested in that. So can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about what we need to be thinking about and preparing ourselves for after we get ourselves to the polls on November 3rd. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I just wanna say what an incredible event and it's a, it's a really big honor um, to be here with you all this evening. Um, I, I can't speak too much to the Democracy Defenders because I'm not organizing that, but I know it's a, it, I believe that's the name it used to be called um, United Front. Uh, it's a co coalition between working family parties and movement for black lives. It is, it is partisan, which is another reason I won't speak to it because I'm ACLU of New York, which is nonpartisan. But I, and I, I also tried to find the info on it. I couldn't, but I know that common cause is um, hiring uh, uh, voter protectors, which I put in the link, but I put in the chat earlier. I'll say, I'll just say really quickly that um, a couple people have put in stuff in the chat around the election and I just want to um, encourage folks to begin messaging now that there is no election night, that the idea of an election night this year is going to be really dangerous, that, the, that it's going to be called on election night is a really uh, dangerous concept and it's actually going to be an election process that might uh, take place November 3rd through January 20th. And so I'm encouraging my volunteers, uh, it's, I know we're all pushing really hard between now and November 3rd, but we're, we can't rest when November 3rd happens. That's when civil society needs to show up and, and in mass protests and mass non-cooperation and say that we don't consent to what's happening, whatever happens after that. Um, and so at, on the ACLU of New York's part, we're going to be, um, um, we want to protect the right to protest. That is a civil liberty that we all, that we all have. And so we are going to be um, training up uh, protest monitors between now and election day. And we're, we're kind of designing the, the structure of that. We've been doing a lot of that in the Uprising for Black Lives this summer. And, and, and my colleagues have been, been holding that um, structure. So as soon as I get information about that, I'm, for sure set it out. And I also shared a resource in the chat box called Choose Democracy. They have a game plan for what people should be thinking about and preparing for um, in case uh, there's, you know, in case, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, so check out that resource in the chat box. Um, let's see, uh, Bob Doherty and the Justice Project. Um, Bob, do you want to say anything before I have, I want to go back to Gavin, but do you want to say something? Uh, yes, <clears throat> we're the Justice uh, Center of Rensselaer County, and we're new. We just got incorporated about five weeks ago. We do have a website, the Justice Center of Rensselaer County. I can post it in the chat and I will, and that will describe what, we're, uh, what our aims are, 
um, who the members of the boards are. We have some bios in uh, and some sections to read, including the important voting uh, menu on our website. Um, as we are now formulated, we'll uh, take positions that we think our advocacy can be effective, um, and in some cases foil and uh, go through dialogue on our website and more formally uh, outside of our website take actions. Um, we're meeting October the 1st to prioritize our first uh, initiatives um, in advocacy and very likely it will be on voting and the very things that you're raising. Why are these locations uh, unavailable to minorities in, uh, in our community? It's absurd. So. Um, those are the kinds of things. I, that we're also having a very interesting symposium that I think people would enjoy participating in. Um, and we're doing it in concert with Alice Green's um, uh, Justice Center. And Schenectady, Albany, and Troy will all have their own public officials um, being interviewed with um, uh, Rick Smith. And then we'll have a, um, a community panel made up of uh, local people to discuss what the public officials are discussing. So uh, stay tuned. I think we'll be an active member advocating for important issues all related to justice in our community. Thank you. Bob, thanks so much for that. And if you could post uh, how we can learn more about your project in the chat box, that would be super. If you don't, though, we're going to yes, find I'm it out. do that right now. Great. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to acknowledge we've got so many amazing people in this town hall. Um, I, I can't let it go without just acknowledging Naomi Jaffe, who's been, you know, involved in this movement, in these movements for justice for, for decades. Um, so just, you know, shout out to Naomi for being on this call and all the work that she's done over the decades. Um, I want to throw it back to Gavin for a minute because, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about is so, so heavy and depressing. And the question that someone had for you in the chat box is, what has changed uh, over the past few decades? And I added to that, what tools do we have now that we may not have had before? What, what gives you hope? Oh, Gavin, you're on mute. I said, uh, there's a lot to unpack. What an amazing discussion this has been. Um, and yeah, there, there, there's a, a big part of the film of my making the film and actually discussing the film with various organizations over the last uh, year or, or so. Uh, I, I, these issues come up again and again. And, and uh, you know, as a, some of them, you know, are a little delicate for me as a middle-aged white guy to, to sort of wade into a little bit um, more like you know I get a lot of why should I vote right that's a real big it's so difficult to, to get people you know it's a very personal thing voting and, and and the and the idea that you know you can't tell people who to vote for and you can't tell people they have to vote they have to really engage on their terms and you got to meet them where they are but I, I do think that the film and what I try to say about it is that to provide that historical context is that historically we're winning. I mean, it may not seem like we're winning, but we're winning. What do I mean by that, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters who really get just pissed off that they, he keeps getting bypassed. But, you know, national health care is on the table. Like this is something that was not even an issue that was being discussed five years ago, right? Uh, gay rights, trans rights, these are things that are being advanced, uh, never as fast as we would like, right? But we're, we're moving the needle in the right direction. We, the, the discussions are moving in the right direction, but always slower than we want. We all want instant gratification. We want justice. We want it now, right? So just a quick history story here. In 1964, Bob Moses and his, and his cohort, you know, they formed their own little political party called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And it was designed to go to the Democratic Convention back when conventions meant something, where like the states voted and they had backroom deals and all this kind of stuff. And Mississippi had an all-white delegation. 
blacks were not allowed to be delegates to the political process. There was no rule in the Democratic Party that said that was the case. That was a Mississippi rule. So they said, screw that. And they put together their own delegation. They put forth their own candidates. They followed the Democratic Party rules to the letter. And they just showed up in Atlantic City and like turned over the apple cart, right? Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer had a really rousing, historic uh, you know, speech in front of the Rules Committee, uh, the Credentials Committee, arguing for why you know, she wanted representation now. Like this is, this is our right to have this. And they were 100% in the right. There was no question that they were the absolute rep, you know, proper representatives of Mississippi. But the entire Southern delegation of the Democratic Party threatened to walk out of the convention. Lyndon Johnson was now on the ballot for the first time since Kennedy's assassination. Nobody was interested in this fight except for these people, right? They, they weren't ready to hear it. So literally what they did was they just kind of swept them off the table. And so what happened was all these young people who fought this fight just sank, right? They were so dejected. They felt just gutted because they played by the rules. They did everything correctly. They were in the right and they didn't win. Right, So a bunch of them walked away dejected. They left the movement entirely. It helped to radicalize SNCC into more like the Black Panther Party. So that what emerged the Black Panther Party came right out of that convention. John Lewis got ousted as the chairman of SNCC. Stokely Carmichael got elevated. All this happened in the wake of the 1964 convention where these people ran up against absolute power and got swept aside. But guess what? In 1968, Every single thing they asked for in 1964 got implemented, right? So it, they didn't win the battle, but they won the longer term aspect of things, right? So it's always, it's always helpful to, to think about that context, right? I mean, like where are we, I, you know, I can't say that things are great for black people right now. I'm not in a position to say that. It's clearly not, right? We wouldn't be marching in the streets having these, these things, but at least now we're marching in the streets, right? We're having this national dialogue about white supremacy and white privilege and all these things that we weren't having before. We're, we're ready to have that discussion, at least many of us are. So voting, and especially at the state level, right? Uh, Jennifer was talking earlier about uh, early voting, I think, right? If you didn't vote in uh, a, a, a slate of candidates willing to implement early voting in New York, you still wouldn't have early voting in New York, right? That's not a presidential election. That's your state representative that's making that happen. You know, your board of ed, your district attorneys, as Corinne said. I mean, it's, it's, these are the people that affect your life on a daily basis. You know, the judges, the DAs, the commissioner of police, the mayors, the selectmen, all these people, you know, that don't get the Trump-Biden, you know, play on air, they're the ones who really affect your lives a lot more. And I can't stress it enough. And I, I cut it out of the film because it's its own film uh, about gerrymandering. This is a census year, right? So guess what? Whoever wins the state houses in this year, they get to draw the congressional districts for the next 10 years, right? So the gerrymandering that's in play where they lock in these, these ridiculous firewalls where politicians literally get to choose their voters rather than voters getting to choose their politicians is, is absurd. But that, you know, much to what Anastasia said, it's a crooked game. You know what I mean? But it's the game we have. It's the only game we have right now. And, you know, James Foreman, who was the chair of SNCC for a long time, you know, th there's like an old cliche, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu, right? And, and also, you know, he famously put it, if you're not going to give me a seat at the table, I'm going to knock the damn legs off the table, right? You got to get in and you got to be part of the conversation. You, uh, Speaking of knocking the, uh, the legs off the table, Gavin, um, I think many of us are feeling very hopeless about the Supreme Court. Mm. And I know we have a question in the chat box and I have a question living in my heart about what happens if if and when, I guess, the Democrats cave and there's no more tricks left in the bag and we're on the verge of getting another, um, 
another Trump pick on the Supreme Court. I'm so mad about Merrick Garland, man, that, you know, there was nothing we could do. Is there anything we can do? Does uh, know? Is there anything we can do? The short answer is no, quite frankly. Uh, the, 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 unfortunately, the Republican Party has shown their willingness to exercise their power in a very absolute way. And right now they have the power to do this and they're not really ashamed about pushing it through. They will do what they can to push it through. I think that fight's lost, right? The question then becomes, unfortunately, Demo and I'm, I'm, I'm a Democrat, I'm not ashamed to say it, my, my film is, tries to be more nonpartisan than that, but you know, Democrats historically bring knives to gunfights. You know what I mean? And so they either have to start wielding power in a way that Republicans do, you know, which would be, you know, getting rid of the filibuster, court packing, all the things that they do uh, to fight back, or they're just going to continue to clutch their pearls and say, aren't they mean? And that's kind of what, that's kind of what we're in for right now. And I, I mean, so much is at stake with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a child with, that has uh, uh, an immune disease that, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to get her insurance, right? If they get rid of that, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. There'll be millions of people at stake. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to say it so, so clearly, but for all those people who had the same argument back in 2016 about Hillary versus Trump, this is a direct result of that, right? I mean, yeah, you only have two choices, but one's a, you know, sociopathic lunatic and one is just kind of a run-of-the-mill disappointing Democrat, right? So I, I think you, you, there are real consequences to these elections and the consequence of the last election was three Supreme Court picks. Right, and, it, and, and I think it's, it feels like bringing us back full circle because what you're, what you're acknowledging is there may not be any procedural tricks left in the, in the trick bag or the toolkit or whatever, but, but we do we do have options, right? We have direct action. Mm -hmm. And that's what people did when we were out of tricks and out of tools before. And so I just feel like that discussion brings us full circle. And if there are, there are no procedural moves left, our procedural move as a people is direct action. And I'm not, you know, I think talking about that is well beyond the scope of this town hall, but I'm glad it came up. And if people have any resources about what that direct action might look like or how to connect with one another, please share it here. Um, one of the things in that, uh, in that um, link that I shared with you about defending democracy is about finding your people in your town. Like we got to find one another because if you're heading out to the streets without five other people, you're doing it wrong. So uh, find five other people. Yeah. And in the film, I mean, what you can see in the film is what people were prepared to do. What are you prepared to do? They were prepared, you know, to, people died, you know, just to get people registering to vote. I mean, how committed are you to preserving this democracy? And I think I mean, that- look, The conservative columnist, David Brooks is asking us the same thing. He wrote a column in the New York Times, and he said, what are you prepared to do to defend democracy? A conservative Republican is asking us that because our democracy is at stake. Um, all right, well, we are out of time. Gavin, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, I'm going to post the link to the PSAs that I made, by the way, just so people, if they want to share them online uh, about voting and things of that nature, that they're, they're short. Uh, they're under a minute each. Uh, except for the one about John Lewis, where he's talking about Bloody Sunday, but I put them in the chat. There's five of them, so you guys can, uh, you know, they're yours to do with as you will. Um, Great. Gavin, thank you so much. I want to thank all of our speakers. We're so out of time that I can't even mention you by name, but Anastasia, Jennifer, uh, Noreen, uh, Renee, you know, Sierra, um, eh, forgetting your name, Sierra's friend, but thank you so much. Uh, for everything everyone said, we're going to send you resources now that you've uh, that you're in our circle here. And I hope that um, I've got my five people on this screen somewhere. So um, thank you all. Have a good night. Good luck in all of your efforts. And um, we'll see you out there probably.